What are you doing? So thank you for coming back and joining us today at sleepapnea.org for our speaker series. We're humbled and honored to have Dr. Zizi Seishas join us from the NYU uh, Sleep and Langhorne Behavioral Department. Uh, this is not the first time we've spoken with Dr. Seishas. Uh, this is actually a follow-up to an interview we did, a, I think, almost a year ago, if I'm not right. Does that sound about right? About two years or so. Yes, about that. Yes. Yeah, time flies when we, uh, yes. we try to save the world here. Absolutely. <laughs> so we're, 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 we're also joined today by uh, Miss Eugenia Brooks, who's our, uh, who's, uh, we've met through Dr. Satius a couple of years ago, was actually a uh, uh, participant at our FDA uh, patient-focused medical product development meeting in D.C., and Eugenia is also our uh, monthly blogger and a community leader for us at sleepatme.org, and she actually lives in Brooklyn and will be uh, telling us firsthand about what's going on uh, in, in, in the backyard is sort of the ground zero where uh, the current crisis is, is starting to happen. We're also joined by Ms. Teresa Schumard, uh, who is on the phone, and uh, she runs our forums and our uh, social media channels. And, and last but not least, uh, Jill Friedman, the founder of ACOR and of Smart Patients, who's been our, our strategy officer for the last few years at, at sleepatme.org and is helping us uh, grow into a uh, overlapping community with a lot of other communities since sleep seems to overlap with cradle to grave and chronic to rare. So welcome everybody. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, I think it's more important and, 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 and crucial in light of current times and era that we, we talk about the so-called health disparities. Uh, it's being thrown around on the news. It's being thrown around in the newspapers. Can you explain to us and our communities what health disparities is and what it means to you as a professional and what it really means to us in the public and how it affects us? Sure. Um, so thanks again, um, Adam, um, and to um, the American Sleep Apnea Association, as well as to your um, wonderful um, audience who are out there, as well as my fellow panelists. I think this is an important meeting and an important conversation that needs to, ha to happen, um, especially in a time of crisis. And so, you know, typically what happens is that in health crises, um, health inequities and health disparities become even more magnified. Yeah. Um, and that is what we're actually seeing currently um, in the wake as well as in the midst of the largest um, you know, global pandemics that we have had in recent years. And so in, in a nutshell, um, health disparities and health inequities can be described in several different ways. First of which is, if you recognize that there is a group of individuals, whether it be racial, ethnic um, minorities, or folks from different socioeconomic backgrounds, or people of different immigrant status, if they are significantly burdened by a health condition more so than others, and there isn't any potential biological reasoning behind that, then that is merit and that is warranted um, as a potential health disparity issue. Not only is it has to, not only health disparities have to do with whether or not if there is a difference more prevalence, but also health disparities have to do with the rate of access to treatment. So for example, it's very well evidenced and documented, not just in this particular um, you know, health crisis and pandemic, that who are the individuals who actually get tested more so than others? Who are the individuals who actually um, get treated in a timely fashion? So access to healthcare and quality and value-based healthcare is another access that allows us to understand health disparities. And typically, um, racial ethnic minorities, as well as um, low income, um, some inner city and rural communities have disproportionately worse um, and inadequate access to value-based care. 
And you see that being magnified today. And that's one other axis in which we can actually look um, at, at health disparities. Another axis, so, so this is the third axis by which we can understand health disparities, is actually um, how do people fear after treatment? Um, so for example, if someone um, you know, um, still gets you know, treated and for all intents and purposes is value-based where they get good quality health care, but for some reason um, they may you know, have poorer outcomes, poorer long-term outcomes. Um, death rates may be higher. Um, quality of life may be worse um, um, among certain racial ethnic groups or any particular group. Then that would be warranted as a significant health disparity. And so what I laid out to you was more a quantitative approach whereby you look at prevalence rates, you look at access in terms of how healthcare delivery, and the other looks more so at the outcomes, the long term consequences of healthcare. And those are the three major axes or lens through which we, def we, we generally define and understand health disparities. I got to remember to unmute myself. Yes. yes <laughs> that, is, that is a mouthful in, in itself. And my it's, apologies it's, for that. <laughs> that's not you. It's, that's my fault. <laughs> uh, but I'd like to almost turn that and go right to Eugenia and say, Eugenia, when you hear the word health disparities, what, what does that mean to you as a patient uh, who is so-called fits that, 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 that label or that, that I don't want to say profile, um, but you're in that cohort, so to speak? Well, you know, when I hear that phrase, I think about the community in general and about the images that I see on social media and the television. You know, we have, uh, we still have the, the, the commuter service on the trains and the buses, people, okay, packing in on the trains. Um, you have people still gathering at the corners. They're standing close in line at the eateries. Okay. I'm hearing numbers like there's a 30% disparity with African Americans and other people of color as opposed to, uh, whites, uh, you know, these are the images and the things that goes through my heart. And then I know what my own experience is as a disabled person that's African-American. Okay, I'm on disability. I am unable because I'm high risk to go out. It really is not a good idea for me to go out. So when I try to access things like delivery services to come in. I run into all sorts of barriers because being on disability, I don't have a regular bank account. I don't get enough money to have a bank, regular bank account. And I, so I utilize things like um, uh, 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 preload cards. Okay. Well, they're not generally accepted. If it's not a regular Visa or MasterCard, Okay, or a debit card from a well-known bank, Instacart won't accept that, and the other delivery services won't accept that. So now, how do I get food and supplies into my house? I can't go out, and they won't bring it to me. Not that I don't have the money, okay, but because that's not their accepted idea of what to use, and so therefore they deny me access. There's all these different things going on, and that's what it means in the community. And then when I see things like my friends who work for the MTA, and they put up the postings for the death toll, and at this point it's 41 people, and when you look at the roster, they're mostly African American or Hispanic, the name. So you, you can clearly see it just in general areas, general things that there is this huge disparity. And I don't, 
I don't know what to tell people when you when you speak to them. You have those that when you ask, why are you gathering? Why are you not, you know, home where you'll be safe? And they're angry and they're perturbed and they're confused because they've heard they should they they've heard. It's okay to not wear a mask. Now it's it's not okay to not wear a mask. Um, things are no longer available and they can't get access to it. Um, they just feel jerked around and they reach that point of frustration where they just said, forget it. I- I'm just going to go forward and whatever happens, happens. I, I think that's a great place for us to jump back off with, with, with Dr. Stasius because you're, you're well, you know, one person, one patient, uh, one person that I'm sure is, is not the exception, Eugenia, but I would imagine the, the, the rule and the standard right now. So, I mean, just to clarify, I mean, if there was 41 people from the MTA that are, that are on the, the, the recent deceased list, that's scary because, you know, that the, the buses must run, the food must go, the garbage must be cleaned. And these are the people that, you know, from the outside looking in, you know, are, are, are these people being sacrificed uh, to keep the machine running? Exactly. And, and, and that's a scary thought. And, you know, I'd, I'd let, I'll put that back to you, uh, Dr. Satius, and just sort of, you know, you're there, you're on the ground, you're at NYU. Uh, you know, obviously, it's one thing when we're talking to your colleagues and the professionals, but, you know, when you walk out those doors, what's really happening? Sure. Um, so, so, you know, b- before I, I launch, you know, I should have probably mentioned that m- my views are my own and, and, and they don't reflect the views of NYU Langone. Um, and, and I know um, NYU Langone, as well as all hospital systems, um, are, are doing their best um, to really fight um, this pandemic. Um, so with regards to what Ms. Brooks said, she, she eloquently said it, and, and I think you know, many people feel this, particularly um, uh, when, when, when you see um, the deceased list looking like yourself, um, the, the, the perfunctory question is, am I next? Um, and, 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 and it's a hard um, pill to, to swallow. Um, but if I were to provide some context to your audience that the MTA is or um, public transportation system, it's unlike any other public transportation city worldwide. Um, it, it has um, several um, methods and modes of transportation from subway slash train to bus to, to shuttles. And, and so when you, know, you have a, a densely populated area um, trying to move around and it's estimated to 8 million, then that in many ways, just the geography and the structural layout of New York um, is very ripe um, for having some viral pandemic and outbreak. And that is the unfortunate thing. That, however, does not negate the point as to why is it that there's certain um, health disparities and health um, inequalities and why do they exist? And so if you were to look at several platforms, I know there is one website where you can type in someone's zip code and you can see um, the the, the incident rates of COVID positive cases. And you can see how many people were tested and how many people um, are tested positive. And this is not a scientific um, assessment because the data um, is is replete mistakes because they are coming in rapidly in real time. And so this is why um, many of the public health officials have held off on releasing these numbers because they're, 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 these data aren't necessarily accurate at this point in time, and they're just fluid and in flux. But again, does not negate the fact that, as Ms. Brooks um, rightfully pointed out, that you know, there's an element to health disparities that you don't necessarily need data to verify, and which is the eye test, right? So I'm a huge sports fan. And you know who is a good athlete from who is not a good athlete. And similarly, health disparities, particularly among groups of individuals who are perennially affected by health inadequacies, that you don't have to show them the numbers. 
And when you tell them and when reports come out and say that certain groups of individuals are disproportionately affected by this, then they would say, of course I knew that. I'm not surprised by that. And that is an unfortunate thing in this day and age, especially in an industrial country as the United States. And in all fairness, you know, um, it is a tough pill to swallow in one of the greatest cities in the world, in that of New York City. And so there are certain things that might be going on. So structural factors. So for example, um, New York is very densely populated. Um, um, it has um, several high-rise buildings where it houses thousands of individuals. Um, and so they don't have the benefit of um, socially or physically distancing themselves, um, that they're more shared and communal spaces, um, oftentimes ripe for easy um, transmission of, 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 of COVID virus. And so in many ways, how it, the, the city is laid out um, doesn't lend itself um, to um, you know, being separated physically or socially. However, when you do look in urban areas, certain urban inner, inner city communities, whereby the housing setup is, 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 dis, is distributed in a way that there is overpopulation and over, you know, there's a high level of density, then this is where um, you can see this may actually be occurring. Um, and so when you also look in these communities, that these communities may not have a We might have lost Dr. Uh, Satius there. Uh, mm. uh, let's see if he can come back in. Um, Eugenia, this might be a good time when, when he comes back in to sort of talk about, you know, what, what, what you saw happen in your building, um, what you were wondering about. Right. Oh, I this, this. Can you sort of tell us what, what happened in, in your backyard? Uh, well, in my backyard, uh, you know, there's here in Crown Heights, we have a hot spot as big as the others that are out of Long Island, as, as big as a New Rochelle, okay, what's going on in Manhattan. And I've seen reports on major news channels, Channel 7, ABC, and, and I saw it also on uh, CBS, where they were talking about the trailer truck that they have put by Kings County Hospital downtown in Brooklyn and also over by Brookdale Hospital here in Brooklyn because the morgues in the hospitals are overflowing. And so they've resorted to freezer trucks to put the bodies in, you know, for storage for the time being until they can address the families can address doing something about the dead. And were, I mean, were, 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 were you mentioning to me the other day that, that someone had passed away in, in your building? Someone passed away upstairs on the fifth floor all over the weekend. And uh, they passed away. They found them on Saturday, and, but they weren't able to move them until Sunday night going into Monday. He, he's, he's back? Okay. <laughs> It's quite all right. We know how to roll with the flow here. Uh, uh, Eugenia was just telling us that um, in her building, they found someone uh, passed away a couple of days ago and, and, and all her and her neighbors were sort of worrying about, you know, why did that guy pass away? Why was the body left there so long? And, you know, the mind starts to wander. So, you know. Yes, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. I think this is one of the occupational hazards of, of this you know, right. new normal. I think the bandwidth of, of streaming is, is tough. Um, so <laughs> my apologies. Um, I'm not sure where I left off, but I'm sure Miss, Miss, Miss Brooks picked up nicely. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the hot spot where Eugenia lives is in, is in Crown Heights. And, uh, and, you were, and Eugenia was mentioning us, Miss Brooks, that, that uh, a, a recent neighbor had passed away. Yes. And you, and you were telling me the other day, you know, you know, that that happens. That's part of life. Um, but what really got your antennas going and the hair on the back of your neck going was 
Wow. What happened to him? He, 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 the gentleman, the gentleman was very active. This is supportive housing here. Okay. And the building is for people with both physical and mental disability. Okay. And the gentleman, okay, uh, had a physical disability, but he was still very active. Okay. Um, and talking about misinformation. Okay. This thing going back and forth, you know, he, uh, and we're now concerned about the fact because Kenny was in and out, you know, he'd go to the corner to get breakfast and he'd go up to McDonald's to get lunch. And okay. So he was out and about. He, older gentleman, uh, heading towards 60. So he he wasn't much for a whole lot of fuss, okay. There were no no mask, no gloves, okay. Just went his way, and um, so it was a little disconcerting when they found him, of course, because I mean life happens, but we still have to wonder, okay, did he pick up something? He wasn't the type to complain if he had. And then there's the issue of well, where are you going to go? Because they're telling us they're telling us not to go to the hospital, yeah. Unless you are in dire circumstances, okay. Yeah. You know that kind of thing. We can't get tested because they just. I mean, they, they still don't have adequate testing, so that's not. You know, so we're just here, and we're just you know. So now what do we do? <laughs> what are we in for? Okay. <laughs> they, you know, this is, this is the reality of it. I think this is, I think what Ms. Brooks um, is, is mentioning is, is something that, you know, many um, disenfranchised um, communities are, are fearful of, right? that um, their stories don't get featured or documented um, in, 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 in the media. Um, and that is huge, right? Because we know that um, it, having some recognition that there is a problem can galvanize um, as many resources as possible. So, you know, including myself, you know, I am working, you know, on a few initiatives um, you know, with, you know, folks trying to connect, um, you know, private sector companies um, with, you know, low resourced um, medical um, facilities. So, so I'll give you, I'll paint a picture to your audience as to what this looks like. So um, there are certain um, health institutions who don't necessarily have a very robust supply chain office. And by that, for your audience, these are the individuals who handle all the procurement of PPEs as well as other medical devices. And so, you know, um, more highly resourced um, medical facilities who have that robust personnel um, handling that already have a lot of storage, already have vendors in the pipeline whereby they can reach out to them easily to procure um, some of these um, devices as well as PPEs. And so what we're trying to do in the initiatives that I am actually trying to facilitate and lead with private sector is not just saying, hey, we're going to provide PPEs, because oftentimes when you order a delivery of PPEs, who is it going to go to? Who is in charge of the logistics, right? And so this is where I, I've heard this, where there are some vendors who would prefer, you know, dealing with, you know, um, 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 hospitals that have a more robust um, um, supply chain system. And so what we're also trying to do is not just donating PPEs, but providing the necessary logistics. And so this is where, when you look at health disparities, to bring that back to full circle, it's not just um, whether or not if a particular group of individuals um, have access or not, or more diseased, but in many ways, it has to do with some of the fundamental important institutional structures that can facilitate care. So this could mean, you know, um, do I get someone a ventilator within 12 hours when they come to the, the emergency room, as opposed to waiting four days because there is a low supply. So these are some insidious ways in which 
um, health disparities and health inequities from a zip code perspective can really affect a community. That, that makes, that'll take your breath away. <laughs> it's, it's tough. It, it's, it's tough. Jills, do you sort of want to jump in here, maybe talk about some of your cancer patients and uh, the health disparities and, you know, a lot of them are uh, immunocompromised or, or what, what they're going to do right now, what you're hearing from? Um, uh, sure. But before I do this, I have a question for Dr. Seixas. Mm -hmm. With COVID-19, even more than with most other diseases, the preventing, preventive aspect is really fundamental. Yes. We can really make a huge difference if we do the right prevention. Yes. And health disparities are not just in treatment. They also apply, and perhaps even more, about the prevention. Absolutely. And, and what Eugenia was telling us is basically the people in our neighborhood don't have the access to the right information to yes. be able to do the right prevention. So uh, I wanted to... Sure, I agree. I, and, and I agree with you. So when we tackle, you know, so at, at NYU, you know, all our projects, particularly the ones that Ms. Brooks participated, you know, in, in different programs, um, uh, you know, what we try and do, we try and take a multi-pronged approach. Um, and I call it the healthcare delivery continuum from access to adherence, right? Um, and there's so many different components in that. So you are absolutely right. So I, I think in, in, and I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to play you know, Monday morning quarterback, you know, I'd never question, you know, um, our leaders, I think our leaders in some ways, you know, um, are doing what they can do. And, you know, and I mean, leaders from, you know, governmental to, to, to healthcare facilities, as well as, you know, um, other, you know, folks who are in charge. And, and, and the, the critical thing is that we need all hands on deck. We need people who are experts in health communication. So I'll give you an example. Um, when, when, you know, when the spring breakers were in Florida um, and, and, and there was some, you know, conversation as to, you know, why is that, you know, they're not listening? Why is that they don't care about, you know, grandma and mom and their grandpas and all of that? And it wasn't that, you know, we have to find ways in which we can reach millennials as well as Gen Zs, right? And so what you've seen people to do, people start doing, is how to reach millennials. So you, you reach them through celebrities. And so, you know, you started seeing that shift as to how is it that you can reach the different demographic and customization. It's a similar thing when you're trying to reach out to hard to reach communities or communities like um, Ms. Brooks um, 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 highlighted and identified. But I agree with you that there has been too many mixed messages as to what it can be, what can be done. Um, personally speaking, um, I can say that, you know, um, I, I really admire and, and, and love the leadership of my institution um, because we, they, we actually put, you know, um, a travel, a domestic and international travel ban um, four weeks ago. Um, and so when, once that happened, you know, um, we all felt, wow, this was extremely serious. Um, and so in my own home, we started making necessary steps as to how we could actually reduce our own types of, you know, social distancing and physical distancing. So prevention is absolutely, absolutely key. How do we do that? Then we have to be able to find most credible messengers, people who are trusted um, within that community to say, hey, this is serious. Um, this actually does affect minorities because for a while there was some weird myth that it did not affect minorities. And when you look at the current numbers that there is, um, some indication that they seem to be affected. I'm not sure if they are affected more disproportionately because, as I said earlier, the numbers are still fluid. But what it does show is that all of us, all groups are predisposed to this thing. And so how is it that we can reach them? We can use them through digital um, um, means, having a central theme and a central message. So not having one person say something and then another person say something else and another person say, oh, but you can do that. You have to be very clear and simple, succinct, and really walk people through 
This is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to get through this. So you don't want to provide support, but not grounded in science, right? And so these are some areas that I think absolutely prevention um, is key. It's tough to prevent a virus and a pandemic. It really is tough. I'm not going to lie. But good question. Well, we, we always knew we were going to have pandemics. It's, it's how do we respond to it? And, you yes. know, uh, is, 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 you know, your favorite saying, and is, is this really going to be the, 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 the epidemic or the pandemic that, that really delineates the haves and the have nots? Yes. Is it access to care? Is it access to a certain intervention? You know, all these barriers that, that we see and we don't see along the way to get to good adherence, uh, especially for, with health disparities and health inequality communities is, it's next to none. I mean, I, I'm sitting here wondering, okay, now we can't go to the barbershop. We can't go to the church. We can't. Yes. Where, 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 do you, where are you telling your community? Where, where should they be going to get the right information, uh, not the misinformation? What, where can we point people okay. towards? I think that's a fantastic question. Um, so I know in my own department, um, the Department of Population Health at NYU, um, we're trying to find um, platforms digitally through a website to provide people with trusted information. Um, obviously, um, creating it is one thing, um, but you know, um, making people aware that it exists is another thing, which is one of the reasons why you know, um, um, you know, um, being on a forum like this is important um, because it, 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 you never know who's going to hear. And when once that person hears, it then becomes, you know, um, um, easily spread. Um, um, and, and so that's kind of one thing that we have to be able to do. Um, and, and, and I think also providing a lot of information to people um, is tough. Uh, I think, you know, there are some, you know, um, to do's and, and things that you shouldn't do. Don't overwhelm yourself with a lot of information, folks. I, if I were to speak directly into, to, to, to your audience, please try not to overwhelm yourself. That does not mean, though, that you should not keep yourself informed and educated. And so, you know, one of the things that we oftentimes educate ourselves about is the rates or the numbers of how many people are dying. That is important because, you know, God rest their souls, that we do want to pay homage to those individuals. But if you are going to obsess over the numbers and watching it tick up and up and up, then that can induce um, certain levels of anxiety, um, a sense of paralysis. And in some ways that can have what we call a boomerang effect where people become tone deaf and they just tune it out. And so they're like, well, whatever, it's gonna happen or maybe it won't affect me. So they have to be careful about that. I think that's a, that's a great thing that you just touched on because I, I, I think that's what you're starting to see now on, 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 in the media and on the news is that people have gotten comfortable with, I don't want to say the social distance, but the physical distance. We're at home. We've, we've, we've limited our lives. Uh, the husband and the wife or the mother and the father or grandma and, 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 and daughter, or what, they're, they're not going together to the grocery store. They're now realizing only one should go. Uh, yes. why, why, why expose both of us? Because we could potentially bring this virus back into our house. So yes. people are starting to make better decisions. But the thing about even like the face mask, it's not that, that we need everyone to wear face masks. We got to get people learning not to touch their face if this is truly a hand to mouth type of, if that's really the way this disease is being, this virus is being passed. And I think it's clarifying why we're asking people to wear masks and why not? And sort of this is the same thing with what we're getting with the CPAPs in our community, because it's like if you're at home, you have that CPAP potentially exhaust and aerosols. But if it's or if you're using it and your health is good and your immune system's good, that's the best chance most likely that you have of preventing getting this virus so you don't wind up in an ICU somewhere. I agree. I agree. So, 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 so uh, let's, let's, let's keep this conversation. I don't want to get a little too nerdy for your audience, but I think it's important. So there's a concept called behavioral economics and behavioral economics has been used in trying to, you know, effectuate, you know, um, you know, you know, you know, health behavior change. And so if we were to take, you know, um, good hygiene as a behavior change that you want to increase, right? So let's take not touching your face. Behavioral economics says that in some ways that, you know, it's, you know, people are going to respond more um, to, to if you take away something from them, particularly if it has a, it's, it's a value, right? 
And so, t- you know, and, and, and this is where I haven't studied this very well. And, and so this is where I want people to be conscious of this, is that if you were to tell someone that they should avoid touching their face, it's a little bit harder to do. But if you tell them in the affirmative, you should wash your hands, they're more likely to wash your hands than to prevent from touching their face. Because in some ways, you know, touching your face is like a reflex for many of us. They said that you touch your face about 3,000 times a day, you know, um, and, and that's the average person. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that we have to be careful about, and again, this is not a science per se, but that there are certain things where, um, you know, for example, if people um, feel as if, hey, you know, if I don't touch my face, then I'm going to help someone out. But it's tough because if I'm socially isolated, this is where people, or if you live by yourself, this is where as human beings, we want physical human contact. And so, you know, I think I'm not saying that people should not, you know, touch their face or anything like they should obviously limit it. But I think the hand washing is, I think, very, 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 very critical. Sorry. Once, ag- once again, I forgot to unmute myself. Go ahead, Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dr. Sanchez, when we talked two years ago, the first time, uh, we talked about the historical lack of trust of the African-American community in the U.S. with the healthcare system in general. Now, the whole country, including all the African-Americans, are facing this catastrophe. And I was wondering... Uh, how this mistrust of the this historical mistrust of the healthcare system is impacting the African American the American the black community. Yeah, yeah sure. No, <laughs> I, I think you know. I think it's a question that 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 I might be able to provide some context, but I think Miss Brooks is definitely you know um, equally, okay. if not more, you know, um, versed at answering that question. But I'll, I'll just take a stab at it. Um, that it's, I don't know if people saw this and I'm not trying to, you know, kind of magnify a story that doesn't need to be magnified, but I only mention it because it, I hope it provides context and pause more so for my healthcare colleagues and scientists colleagues. So apparently there was some conversation, I guess, by two French scientists and they were talking about potentially finding some, um, you know, cure or therapy um, for, for COVID. And, and I, I do not speak French and, and I don't understand French. So I am going to trust what the reports um, said about what they actually said. So I can't say I heard them say that. So I am only reporting based on what the, the, the um, I think it was the business insider said. And it's essentially, and I'll just paraphrase, that they said, oh, well, you know, what we might be able to do is that we could perhaps go to Africa and test, you know, um, you know the first forms of, of, of these medications on, on Africans. And I'm not too sure why they said that. But what that story does is that it adds to an entire narrative of mistrust that many um, have had, and rightfully so, about um, medicine and healthcare fraternity. And someone like myself, who is a biomedical researcher, who trying to get someone like Ms. Brooks to be part of the study um, is, is, is important. And so, you know, that level of mistrust where African Americans or racial ethnic minorities are seen as guinea pigs, so to speak. And I'm, I, I know that's a very poor term, but this is what people describe, you know, um, in, 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 in the streets, so to speak, that that really destroys the narrative that myself and other colleagues have tried to share and to change, saying that, no, being part of medicine, being part of research is important because if we don't test our new therapies on our communities and get a wide view of diverse communities, then guess what? We can't personalize and customize these treatments. And so that's, you know, what I would say. And I'm sure Ms. Brooks, you know, has a lot more um, 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 great things to say about that. 
Uh, but before before Eugenia jumps in, I would just say I, it's almost you know we're damned if we do and we're damned if we don't. But you know to come to you, Eugenia, you know with all the comorbidities that you're fighting and dealing with and managing uh, as an African American woman in this world uh, facing a virus, you know that 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 could potentially break down your immune system. You know it's 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 more urgent than ever that we get the message out to your folks, to your community. Yes, stay at home. This is you don't want any part of this. You don't want to go to, go to that hospital because the old his, historical thing was if you went to the hospital, that's where you went to die. That was the mindset from the African American community. I think it's the same for the for the Latin community as well in in, in the states because of the, the of the, the historical nature of the healthcare system. So I'll get off my podium and let Eugenia speak for herself. <laughs> Absolutely right, Adam, and uh, that's why I spend most of my day. You go over to my social media pages, you see it. I gather as much information as I can and share it constantly to get the word out. When I see other people share, I grab that, I check it out, and I put that up as well. I try to verify it as much as I can to get that word out so that they have, people have the information they need to follow through. And then I've taken my place. as an elder, and I started voicing the words of an elder and reminding people that some of this is just common sense. You were told by your mother when you were knee high to wash your hands, to cover your mouth. Why now as an adult does anyone need to tell you that? Why do we have an entire pandemic that should never have happened had you just Simply washed your hands and covered your mouth. <laughs> okay, we go through this. I go through that. But I, I try to keep that message going. And you're right, you know, I also, I'm a patient advocate. I do participate in trials. Um, I am fully aware of Tuskegee Project and all the other nightmares that were out there. And my take on it is since I was able to educate myself, put myself through school, and I can make informed decisions, that I do so and I follow through on projects and that pertain to my health issues. And I do volunteer and work with them to try to get them the opportunity opportunity to gather the information they need to help us all do better. And I realize and I talk to the community and I remind them that the bottom line is in the face of the unknowing, you have a choice. You can be either a victim or you can be a volunteer. I choose to be a volunteer. They need to do the right thing because I'm a smart chick and I will drag them if they don't. And if I don't, I have a lovely family that I made sure is also equally educated who will drag them for me. (laughs) But otherwise, I think that we just need to participate as much as we can, because look at this situation. This is a new strain of something we know nothing about. And, you know, looking at how it's proceeded, I recognize that we're still learning new things about what is going on with the thing, and it's doing whatever it does, and we've never seen it before, and it's pretty much been a catch-as-catch-can, and I give credit to our leaders for having gotten on board and really given it their all bipartisan manner to make sure that the public got whatever they could give them as soon as they could give it. But from a scientific viewpoint, I also see how there's nothing they can do until they learn what to do. And that's a disservice that we can't do anything about. There's a lot of lessons to be learned from this situation. And I just, I'm sorry that all the loss has to come with it. So I, I know Jill's has a question here that uh, I think to follow up where you're at, Eugenia, that uh, I think that's really on a lot of our minds. 
Go ahead, Jules. Can you hear me, Jules? I think he has I to can, start. I can, I can. Oh, yeah. That's it. Yeah, yeah Dr. Seixas, you are also one of the leaders in your professional association of the use of artificial intelligence and mobile technology. So yeah, yes. a question, already a direct question to you. How do you think that artificial intelligence and mobile technology is going to help uh, in this pandemic, during this pandemic? Uh, I, I think, think I'm a better help. person to ask you. So Yeah, no problem. And thanks for asking that question. Um, I think it can help tremendously. Um, I know there have been several um, what do you call competitions and hackathons held by MIT and Facebook and others that I've been, you know, um, you know, um, affiliated with. Um, and, and there's some fantastic ideas, um, which I, I can't share, obviously, because it's in the midst of the competition. Um, but, <laughs> but, 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 but there's some great ideas and, and, and not just that, you know, I think I kind of alluded to this, um, earlier where myself and a, a bunch of Googlers are, are working to provide a, a certain level of support um, to low-resourced um, um, health facilities. And so in many ways, not only are we trying to provide access to PPE, but we're trying to provide you know, analytics, business analytics in many ways in terms of supply chain. Um, and, and the more resourced institutions um, already have those, those workflows um, set up in place. But with regards to um, artificial intelligence, um, one of the things that I can foresee us doing is finding ways in which we can reach people to you know, prevent um, and, and pro give, you know, provide people with educational material as well as supports that will help them reduce their risk. Um, there's so many different ideas that you know, um, we could um, throw out um, whereby we could connect um, GPS with COVID incident cases and, you know, know where there are certain hot zones and hot spots are so that people can make better decisions. Um, and, 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 and you can do that in ways um, that, that, that um, gather information in real time to individuals. You can also, you know, um, leverage um, the ubiquitous tracking of, of you know, wearables such as your Apple Watches or your phones um, and provide timely information, but also track where people are going so that that also can provide them more knowledge and information as to where the risk areas are. You know what? I'm not going to go to that supermarket because there's a high incidence there. And so let me go to this other um, supermarket if you have you know, um, transportation privileges to do that, you know, whether it be physically or not. And so there's so many different things, you know, particularly in terms of testing. You know, I'm working with a group in France right now trying to come up with a better algorithm that will allow um, folks to actually, you know, um, screen themselves so that they can triage whether or not if they can endorse certain symptoms. And so one of the things that Ms. Brooks mentioned is absolutely correct. You know, the mixed messages that we get, um, particularly at the community level, you know, they say, well, you know, if you're not very sick, you should really stay home. But oftentimes, as you can see, the trajectory of how people, how COVID-19 progresses, that you can really get sick overnight or just over a few hours. And so do you wait? until someone is almost, you know, really debilitated in order to go and access that, then that means that the viral load is already in full effect and that makes them, their presence more lethal to the community as well as to healthcare providers. And so perhaps what we can do is through some kind of triaging method, we are able to triage people and assess risk and know, well, you have a probability that it's COVID or not COVID. And one of the things that we can do also by leveraging large data is that part of us building this algorithm is that when you look globally, you're actually seeing that some of these classic symptoms that they told us three weeks ago aren't so classic, right? That people are having GI, you know, gastrointestinal issues. People are having weird you know, smells and tastes. These weren't classical symptoms. 
And so if we were to leverage the resources of big data and analytics, whereby we can de develop phenotypes and profiles of individuals, then we'll be able to triage and be able to treat and you know, um, monitor people um, as well. I, I think you just set the table for another discussion that we need to have in the future, because it, it's really the question for me and, and where I think this is going is, is if we can't physically get together in large groups for the next year, which is probably a reality until we have a fully developed, diverse vaccine that works for all populations, um, is the African-American community, is, is the Latino community, are, are they going to support medical research via the phone? Are they going to trust that more? than the old traditional ivory white tower uh, academia and the doctor and the code. Is that, is that going to help us break through some of these barriers? Uh, and, I, and I hope so. I mean, I, I think that, that it, 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 you know, it, it, might, it might be the thing. But then again, does everyone have access to data plans and prepaid cards yeah, and, you know. and all that kind of good stuff? So I, I it, you know, I, I know Teresa wants to get a question in here, but I, I'd like to throw to her real quick and then, and then come back to Eugenia. So, if Teresa, if you're ready, I know you had something you wanted to ask. Can you hear us? Maybe. There she is. Go ahead, Teresa. Yay, nay. Little technical difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe next time, Teresa. We're, we'll let Eugenia have the last word. So, uh, well, you can sort of tell us where your head's at after listening to. Uh, the great Dr. Satius and, and, and uh, the rest of us uh, on this little uh, panel here that trying to make sense of this world, Eugenia. You know, after all was said and done, especially listening to what you had to say uh, a few minutes ago, I would like to ask Dr. Satius, um, just based upon, you know, what he sees now and what he knows is going on, can he even begin to assess how long we'll have to continue with the shelter in place and social distancing is, you know, we have the president who's estimating that we'll all be able to go running outside next Sunday and celebrate Easter and freedom again. And of course that doesn't seem too reasonable, but I mean, are we really looking at all summer, fall, winter? Or do you think we'll get a peak sometime soon? Yeah, um, great question. Because I think ultimately <laughs> um, that's what we are all thinking about, whether you are infected or affected, um, that we're thinking about the other side of this pandemic. Um, and, and I think, you know, um, there is... I, I wish I could provide, you know, um, you know, clear um, forecasting as to what will happen. But, you know, I am guided by, you know, some experts from the National Institutes of Health, like Dr. Fauci, who, you know, went to College of the Holy Cross where I went, um, um, guided by his wisdom and his wealth of knowledge that even if um, we obtain this flattening of the curve, which is another issue that I have, but we won't go there, um, <laughs> is that we still can't go back to pre-COVID because, you know, unless we have, you know, some level of herd immunity, and by that I mean all of us are immune to COVID, then we still have to maintain um, the, the necessary steps to avoid, you know, um, you know, physical contacts, um, excessive physical contacts and congregating um, so that we can limit um, the transmission. Um, and, and so what I would highly recommend is really finding ways in which you can still try and obtain the same level of social connectedness that you would have. It's not going to be the same, unfortunately. Um, I know that there is, you know, um, an issue here with the haves and the have-nots, where um, some folks um, who live out in the suburbs versus people who live in inner city, urban communities, that you're able to just go to your backyard versus just staying at your window, um, if you do have a window. 
um, to get some fresh air and sunlight and all these different things. So what I would highly recommend from a mental health and emotional standpoint is try and give yourself a schedule um, and you can create that schedule and ensure you build within that schedule self-care. Um, so enjoy, you know, time with yourself and others and family members, as well as if the, if it's a nice day, um, you know, just going out and wearing your mask and being protected, just getting some sunlight and relative, you know, fresh air. Um, I think it's something that you have to be conscious about that, but just going on, um, and riding the subway and just going as if nothing um, happened is not going to be with us for quite some time, unfortunately, until there is a vaccine to develop immunity, um, herd immunity, um, as well as a potential therapeutic. So sorry, I wasn't, I didn't bring good news. <laughs> no, uh, I, I think you brought, you brought level-headed, calm, and, and, and a voice of reason and a, and a trusted doctor and a, and a doctor that trained under the same school as Dr. Fauci, who, you know, go down as probably one of the greatest American heroes of all time when it's said and done. Yes. Um, I hope that we could all come out on the other end of this, sort of help reinvent what healthcare is because we can't go back to pre-COVID. Yeah. There, there, there is going to be a new normal, and what that is, I think uh, we're going to have a lot to do with. Yes. Um, but unfortunately, the health disparities and health inequality communities are being affected by this because of, they usually are thrown as the guinea pigs to the, to the wolves in, in times like this. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's the sad, unfortunate truth. But this is the first time you have a virus that doesn't discriminate. Everyone can get it. And one way or another, we're all affected or affected by it one way or another. And I can't thank you enough. I know we've, we've gone a little bit over our normal time. but uh, I, there's no reason we can't do this again. I want to thank uh, yourself, Eugenia, uh, Jills, and, and Teresa, even though she got cut off uh, with some of our bandwidth problem. Uh, we're going to be doing this speaker series every Tuesday and Thursday at 3. Uh, come back, join us, live chat, uh, and we will have more great experts like Dr. Statius, and, 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 and we're thinking about you and, and your colleagues and, and you. all the healthcare providers that are, that are at Ground Zero, and we're learning so much from you around the country. Yes. Uh, that, that I hope that, you know, that everyone else doesn't, you know, let their breath out and relax and know that, you know, just because we're not necessarily seeing it in our backyard, it's coming and it's not yes. pretty. Um, and, you know, take care of yourself, put your mask on first before you help others around you. And, and we all have something, you know, we all, we all have a, a way to help in this. I know Eugenia's got one last thing she wants to get out. Go ahead, Eugenia. Well, I just, you know, I just want to get out that, you know, Wash your hands, yes. cover your mouth, practice social distancing. Dr. Statius, thank you so much for everything you do, okay? Uh, you, you, your staff, everyone there at Langone, everyone at all the healthcare facilities, I wish you all well. Um, thank you. And Godspeed to finding the vaccine. Yes, we will get through this. <laughs> we will. We will together, and we will.